And hydrogen is one of those where it's the most abundant element in the universe. It's completely clean, except depends on how you extract it from water. If you're using fossil fuels to extract it from H2O water, right. then it's, you know, it's got carbon. But if you're using solar energy or, you know, other forms of uh, renewable energy to extract that hydrogen, then it's a very clean, green resource. So we're also investing in how we can maximize that and how we might be able to compete with the federal government or for federal monies because one of the Biden initiatives was money for hydrogen hubs and California wants to be one of the states with at least one if not more hydrogen. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Glad to be joined again by Senator Nancy Skinner. Nancy, thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate being part of this. Yeah. So it's been, what, 30 days roughly since you guys were uh, out, I guess, in session last time. You had a nice recess and, and here you are back. But I guess before you went on recess, you guys did something pretty big, right? You did what, like a $300 billion budget or something like that? Is, is that we right? We did the largest budget in California history and the largest budget of any state in the U.S. to date. And it was 306 or $9 billion. Yeah. Roughly. What's right. a billion here between friends? Um you know, and there was a lot of talk early on about the surplus, you know, you had a hundred billion dollar surplus, you know, at the end of that, how much of that surplus was, was, was spent and used and how much I guess saved for the future? Well, we put a good amount in our rainy day fund, our reserves. We have a variety of reserves, which is really smart. I mean, I was elected for the first time in the state assembly, right at the point of the recession where right. California's revenues just bottomed out. And we were just having to whack, whack our school budgets, whack budgets for our seniors, whack budgets for, um, you know, health care, things that really, really affected people's lives. Now with our, we smartly have been keeping the tradition of saving money. So we have a safety net reserve. We have a rainy day fund reserve and we have a schools, a prop 98 reserve. And in total, those reserves are over $40 billion. Wow. And so like, for example, like when you first started working budget, or I guess, as far as you remember, like what was the size of California's budget um, that you can recall? Well, so when I got elected in the assembly, I think the budget at that time was like 90 billion total, but wow. then it dropped by 30 billion because of the recession. So, yeah. It's That's amazing. So like in 2010, for example, like the, you're saying the budget was like 60 60 billion and now it's 300. Well, 2009, it was, yeah. So, yeah. So in the, in that range during the recession, it never exceeded about a hundred billion total. Okay. Wow. And Amazing. now we're at 300. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, when we were all talking, we we're like, wow, a hundred billion dollars. That sounds like so much money. Like it seems like we can fix one big problem um, or, or really solve some issues. Kind of Nancy, what, what are some of the stuff you were excited about that you feel that, you know, you were able to get on top of it and, and really solve uh, for the state? Well, for two years now, I'm so very thankful that we've been in this good position for two years. And I mean, it's ironic because here we are in the pandemic and we had, we still have a lot of people who are not as financially doing as well because either during the pandemic, they needed to uh, quit work to, you know, take care of loved ones because there wasn't, you know, childcare or a facility for them. Um, and then, of course, now we have this inflationary cost. So we have a lot of Californians who, you know, they've been hurting through this period. But meanwhile, we have the wealthiest Californians have been doing great. While the stock market's a little shaky now, for two years there, it was going gangbusters. Right. And because of California's very progressive tax system, we were able to receive revenue from those highest, highest earners. We're talking, you know, multimillionaires and above. So what we've been able to do over those two years is, for example, every California child who goes to a public school gets now two free meals a day, universal school meals, no longer any, you know, proof of your income or whatever, you just get fed, which is so smart. And it improves learning. And there's now relationship with schools and our farmers. So many of our small farmers are being able to sell directly to schools. It's great. And then some of the other things we've done, healthcare, 
So California, of course, we our values are such that we really want to provide health care for all. We believe in that. Um, and what we've had to date is we've had a great under the Affordable Care Act. We've had the exchange called Covered California, and we've been able to provide really low cost health insurance to almost every Californian. But there were still a lot of Californians who you know, either couldn't get Medi-Cal or various things. Right. Now, this budget, we have basically insured either through the, the exchange covered California or through Medi-Cal that every single Californian, regardless of their status, citizenship or otherwise, has access to health care. And that is a that is a fantastic thing. So that's another really great thing we did. And um, there's so much more. It's like even hard to you know wrap your head around it. Our our schools, let's just go to schools again. When I was in that recessionary period, California was almost dead last. It was only Mississippi or Louisiana who right. funded their schools worse than California, if you can believe that. Now we're in the top 10. So we went in a 10 year period. We went from mm, almost dead last to now being in the top 10, which is great. And one of the things that we dedicated money to in this budget was bus rides, because California, sadly, has been dead last when it comes to ensuring that kids have a ride to school. And a lot of kids, their parents work such hours that without a school bus ride, it's hard for them to get to school. So now we're giving school districts way more money so we can help ensure that kids can get to school. So these are some of the great things that this budget did. Well, that's great. You know, you've always been an environmental champion um, and, you know, helped out with, you know, kind of green energy things, kind of what are some of the things you're seeing and, and working on right now to kind of help California achieve its goals to kind of get uh, off of kind of foreign, I, or I guess, I, what do they call that? Fossil fuel, I think. The Fossil term fuel, is. right. Yeah, we need a transition. <laughs> to to get us to a clean energy right. future. The climate crisis yeah. is such we do need that transition. Um, and this budget had some great uh well, California, we still have a, a strong uh, oil economy, meaning not just those of us who still you know, need to put gasoline in our cars, but you know, we still have active oil wells. We have people that work in that sector. And so one of the things that budget did was set aside money so that if there's any job loss in our transition to the clean energy future, we can help compensate, provide support to those workers retraining and just support so that no one's really hurt economically as we do this transition. Um, we also have put in um, funding for electric vehicles. The governor has a executive order where we would, uh, within a few years, not sell gasoline new cars in this state any longer. And to do that, you really have to support people to get electric vehicles right. and what they call the electric vehicle infrastructure. So public charging and such like that. So our budget has very significant funding for that. And then we, you know, we, we know that the climate crisis is already upon us. Look at our wildfires. So there's a really healthy investment in uh, beefing up our firefighting capacity, in our vegetation management so that we can be more fire resistant and lots of things like that to really help us address this, you know, the fact that we're experiencing this right now. Yeah. Kind of a lot of the talk was, you know, even though you know, the budget was signed, it was finalized that you guys still, I guess, have a lot of work to do here in the final 30 days to kind of finalize that with trailer bills and the like. Kind of what are some of the things that are still moving right now that, that you're working on? Well, you mentioned this hundred billion surplus. So, you know, we um, when you have a surplus, you don't really want to put it into what's called ongoing spending. So you don't want to like start a new program that you want to keep going for 10 years because you can't guarantee that you're going to have that revenue. And if right. we look at the economy right now, you know, maybe we won't. So much of that money we wanted to put into what we call one time only. Maybe it's over a couple of years, but into infrastructure investments. So the transportation package, which is going to be multi, multi billions of dollars, um, it's that package will do things like more for roads, more for bridge repair, more for some of that uh, transit and uh, beefing up that transit infrastructure, whether it's say BART or the, uh, you know, our different rail lines, our different city, uh, you know, uh, electric uh, muni services, that kind of thing. So those 
we appropriated the dollar amount, but we didn't finalize the details. So that's one of the things that we're going to have to do right now is finalize those details. And then we have to finalize a few more details in what we call the energy package, which does include things like the electric vehicles, but it also includes, you know, it's hotter. And when it's hotter, more people turn on the air conditioner, for example. And so you have more demand on your electricity grid. We want to make sure that people's lights are on. If you're in a heat wave, if all of a sudden the power goes out, you know, we put people at risk because if you can't be in a, a building that's cool and your air conditioner can't work, you know, that's a health risk. So we're also going to be making investments to make sure that our electricity is reliable. And those are some of the other details that we're working out right now. Yeah, you know, I guess there's like a diverse different uh, types of energy or different ways to reduce it. Uh, you know, some are thought to be clean. Some environmentalists don't think they're as clean. Um, there's always kind of this give and take on, on you know, what, what our base load should consist of. And, you know, right now we're not at the point where we can get, I guess, 100% off all, re all we renewables. We have the goal of 100%. Right. And we're moving there. And, but as you say, there's a lot of details to that because sun is one of our renewable sources. And the sun only shines when the sun's out right. not in the night. So what do you do to create the electricity during the night? Obviously, uh, wind energy is one thing. There's others. So I forgot to mention one of the investments that we have in this budget, which the governor is very proud of, is for offshore wind. In California, look at our great coastline. We've got some great potential for offshore wind. So there's money in the budget to help us develop some offshore wind. But the other thing that we need to do with as we move more and more towards the renewable sources that only run during certain times of the day is what they call energy storage. And some of that is big, big batteries. And so we've got, you know, possibility and many of those batteries are powered by the mineral lithium. And we've got a possibility for lithium mining in the Salton Sea. So we're looking at that. So there's lots of things like that. We're right on that. California has always been a leader in this space, but we're on the cusp of being even a greater leader. And another issue is hydrogen. So that one we, uh, and I'm carrying a bill on hydrogen. Hydrogen is one of those where it's the most abundant element in the universe. It's completely clean, except depends on how you extract it from water. If you're using fossil fuels to extract wow. it from H2O water, right. then it's, you know, it's got carbon. But if you're using solar energy, or you know other forms of uh, renewable energy to extract that hydrogen, then it's a very clean, green resource. So we're also investing in how we can maximize that and how we might be able to compete with the federal government or for federal monies, because one of the Biden initiatives was money for hydrogen hubs. And California wants to be one of the states with at least one, if not more hydrogen hubs. Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of your colleagues come on and a lot of them talked about, you know, buses, trucks, uh, things like that, um, you, relying on fossil fuels and, right. you know, creating our, you know, dirty air, especially yeah. in low income communities. Kind of how, what possibilities That's is hydrogen? Because those big trucks and those buses are diesel and diesel right. not only is the climate pollutant, but the particulate matter from diesel is particularly unhealthy. So we want to move off of that. Right. And so like, I guess, you know, what are the benefits of hydrogen and, you know, how, how can we make this work so we can actually, you know, have clean air now and not in 10 years? Right. Well, hydrogen is one of those fuels that's really good. For example, long haul trucking. And uh, that's why we want to have, but it's while it is good out of the tailpipe, regardless of how it's produced, mm -hmm. if it's produced using fossil fuels, then we don't get the carbon benefit. So we want to produce it from the renewable sources then get it in the truck. And then we have the, you know, the dual benefit of both. We've cut the carbon and we've cut the tailpipe pollution. And that's what we're looking at and focused on in terms of our investments and supporting research and development and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, we're coming out of this, um, you know, COVID, um, you know, world. And, you know, even though COVID is still here, it doesn't appear to be going away. It's just something we're moving on. It's affected us all in different ways, but something you've worked my on <laughs> is called a, a hope account. Can you tell us a little about the hope accounts and how they work? Oh, I appreciate that you brought it up. I forgot to even bring up that part of the budget. So we included a hundred million in the budget this year because tragically we, California has over 30,000 children who are orphaned due to COVID. Now, not all of those children are low income, but many of them are because in the, you know, the first year or so of the pandemic, 
the most of Californians who lost their lives were frontline workers, many of whom were low wage workers. And, uh, you know, they they're passing away, left children, you know, orphaned. Right. And to no fault of their own, you're going to have children who could be very, very seriously economically affected by the loss of one or more parents. So we the hundred million is to create these hope accounts that would establish like a trust fund that those children could access at 18. And the concept is for both the children who lost parents or caregiver to COVID and our children who are in long-term foster care, because they're similarly, they don't have family, they don't have parents to rely on. And many of us, you know, when you turn 18, you're kind of going out on your own, but often you have a family that can help you get that car or pay that first and last month rent, or maybe help you with your college costs. But if you're a child that didn't have that, then you're, you know, it's starting at 18, it's really hard on you. So we wanted to give children that hope and establish these accounts. So when they turn 18, they have access to some funds. So we don't, we haven't worked out the details of exactly how much money would be put in the fund for each child. Um, we're working that out, but we have a hundred million set aside for that purpose to create wow. for those children. That's great. You know, you've always been at the forefront uh, with the Women's Caucus and working on women's uh, reproductive issues and abortion. Kind of what are some of the things that you've been able to accomplish here recently with the Supreme right. Court ruling and uh, kind of this kind of bizarre world we've entered into that we never really thought was possible, but I guess it, it happened. So uh, uh, what can never we do? In my, you know, in my lifetime, look, I came, I came of reproductive age at the point of that decision. So I grew up not having to ever worry about whether if I'm faced with that choice, you know, that I would be uh, in a circumstance to in effect be forced to carry my pregnancy. I didn't have to face that. And it didn't occur to me really. I mean, yes, threat was always there, but I really didn't <laughs> believe that it would yeah. happen. And so fortunately I'm vice chair of the California women's caucus and the, there's these great organizations up and down California groups like Latinas for uh, reproductive justice, black women for wellness, the Planned Parenthood, so many more who came together and created an organization or a coalition called the Future of Abortion Council. They approached the Women's Caucus early on and they said, look, we think this is gonna happen. And you know whether you do or not, we better be prepared. And so we want to get the Women's Caucus to put forward legislation that would ensure that Californians and people who come to California would have their reproductive services have full access and not, you know, that it, they not be uh, made vulnerable legally and all of that. So we have a package of 15 bills, all carried by Women's Caucus members, and many of those bills needed funding. And the budget that we approved just included $200 million to help our reproductive um, health care clinics to uh, you know, staff them up better, to improve their security, to create funds, to cover the costs for say someone's health insurance didn't fully cover the abortion, or if people have practical needs, maybe they have to travel long distance for in California, for example, you've got rural areas where it's a you know, full day travel to get to a clinic. Right. So we, we wanted to make sure that we had the funding to make California's being the real, um, you know, uh, haven for um, for reproductive services. We wanted to make it real, and so that's why we put the funding in the budget and have these great bills. You know, that was interesting. I remember talking to a Kilo Weber uh, before the decision came out. She pointed out it's kind of like, oh, we live in California, right? Like, it doesn't affect us, right? And she was like, well, no, it does because people will come from out of state to our clinics. And, you know, we might not have the funding to help these people out or, um, you know, the avail availability and kind of now this has happened and you're hearing about people having to travel and kind of well, how Akilah can they afford to travel? Aquila represents the San Diego area and the latest articles have shown that the clinics in the San Diego area, and maybe it's because of access to Arizona or Texas, I'm not sure, their demand has just gone up over 30, 40 percent. I was Amazing. blown away this quickly, this quickly. Yeah. So, and, you know, we, um, the fact is, you can make abortion illegal, but it's never going to go away. Right. And so to put, to put people in the position where they have to, to put their lives at risk 
doing something that's medically unsafe. That's just not fair. In California, we feel an obligation to provide the medically careful, medically sound, safe services. Yeah. Well, as the results in Kansas come in and it looks positive. I was so happy about that. Every state can follow in step. And Great. I tweeted, Dorothy and Toto, it's safe <laughs> to go back to Kansas now. <laughs> That's funny. You know, you were very famous for, you know, giving, uh, you know, college athletes the right to go out there and make some money. And, and a lot of college athletes are out there making lots and lots of money out there. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, but recently, you know, we've had this kind of shakeup out here out West where we have UCLA and uh, USC uh, deciding to go join the schools in the Midwest over there. Kind of what, what are your thoughts as a, as a Cal alumni and a, a Berkeley resident about that? And kind of what can we do to keep the, uh, the Pac-12 mm -hmm. together? Keep the UCs well, together, at least. Really, go Bears. Um, so first on the name, image, and likeness rights, interestingly, um, when I first introduced that bill, I figured I would hear from all these guys, football players, basketball players, about how, you know, finally they would be able to, you know, make some money. I only heard from women athletes, student student women. Oh, interesting. And I was blown away. And now, of course, what are we seeing? This is very interesting. While the news is showing a few... Um, uh, you know, very famous uh, college players, quarterbacks, particularly right. football player, you know, making these huge deals. The what's the data that's showing that women that the student athletes are getting in, in, they are taking most advantage of these NIL rights and they have done the best. So you've got like at Fresno State, you've got these women uh, basketball players. They are twins. And they have used their Instagram and TikTok fame to get Boost Mobile and other deals. You've got two uh, sister soccer players from Studio City who've got um, Nike, they're high school players, and they've got a Nike contract. You've got the Jada Williams, the UCLA basketball star. So she's got a huge contract. So women are doing great. Right. But now back to UCLA. Uh, I am not happy because UCLA, not only are you a public ed public institution. You're part of our UC system. So you really need to put your students first and foremost. Now, you know, I'm not naive. It's obvious that college athletics has never put students first. However, you know, a public university needs to be more attuned to you do serve students. Right. And what is the impact of their going to the Pac-10? The games are played across the country. Right. So the NCAA has this farcical 20 hour rule. Every student athlete is supposed to put no more than 20 hours a week into their sports. However, what do they exclude from that travel time? So now you take 20 hours a week of your training, your practices, all this, and you add travel time to that. Pretty soon, where's the time for the student to do their studies, to go to classes, to go? I mean, so we're talking, you're whatever joke there already was about whether students were being put first as athletes. Right. Now it's like, so that's one issue. Another issue is UCLA, you're part of an ecosystem of the whole UC system and your sister college campus, Cal, UC Berkeley is part of that conference that you're quitting. And by quitting that conference, you're gutting the revenue to that whole conference, but definitely to UC Berkeley. So how does that affect all the athletics of Berkeley? And let's talk, this is the 50th anniversary year of Title IX. Now UCLA is already not in compliance with Title IX. Title IX is the law that says women get, you know, gender equity in sports, right. for example. They're already out of compliance. Now UC Berkeley is too, but UC Berkeley may be even more out of compliance if it has less money for sports, because what happens when you drop in revenue to your sports, you look first at the lower generating revenue sports which tend to be the ones that women are in. So, you know, the whole thing is not good when it comes to California. So I'm, I really appreciated the regents recent, the regents recently voted to, in, to really analyze the impact of this decision. They're supposed to come back with the report, I believe on August 17th, I look forward to their report. And you know, if, uh, if I'm not real happy with what's in that report, maybe I'll be doing some legislation next year. Yeah, it's funny, you know, everyone just talks about, oh, the money and the, the football games, the basketball games, how great it is. But yeah, what about the fact that, you know, you have all these other sports that might play multiple times per week oh, sometimes. Oh, football is the shortest right. season. 
You've got the track, track, swimming, tennis, soccer, all of those have longer seasons. Exactly. And again, m- most of those are more women dominated too. So now the female athletes, not only they already get inequity, equity, they are going to have to be on the road more if they're at UCLA and they're going to all these other states to right. play. Yeah, yeah. So it might be great for the, the superstar who's going to go pro and make millions, but for the other student athletes who actually have to right. be students get a degree and get a job later. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, especially since not too many of them are going to end up being pro athletes. So yes, your education is going to have to count for something else. <laughs> right. 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 So I, I know you're also, you know, just a rank and file member as well. You just don't focus on the budget. You have some of your own bills. Maybe some of them are an appropriations committee about to be on suspense, but kind of what, what do you have that you're excited about here coming down the pipe to get to the governor's desk? Good question. Um, I've got a great bill around um, California was one of the first states to recognize that if you are the victim of crime, the there's a lot uh it's traumatic, of course, but also there's costs involved. You know, maybe you've had to stay out of work for a little while. Maybe you, you know, loss of property, what have you. There's many things that um, as a result of your being a victim of crime that uh, really puts puts a burden on you and your family. And so California has a program, the Victims Compensation Board, to support right. victims of crime. But we've never funded it adequately. And then we also, I think, kind of inadvertently put in rules that excluded some people who are victims of crime. And so the neighborhoods where that have, unfortunately, the highest crime rates also have the crime victims who've least been able to benefit from our program. And so we, my bill would kind of change those rules so it's much more inclusive rather than an exclusive and put more funding into our crime victim program because all the data shows if you support a crime victim you bring crime rates down you create it's not that everybody is you know going to create revenge but if you've had a bad if you've been a crime victim and you've not had a good interaction with the criminal justice system you feel like you were unfairly treated and all maybe you aren't as cooperative with law enforcement in the future or you know or maybe you take law into your own hands so the right. more robust your crime victims program is the more benefits you get from public safety so that's one of my bills that i'm very excited about um and then of course i my it was my bill that set up the concept for the um hope accounts and uh and then i have um uh some bills around hydrogen and bills on uh, our cement industry to allow us to capture carbon from cement because cement is a very carbon intensive industry. And I'm really happy about right. that. And those are some of the good things I'm doing this year. Well, great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Good luck with uh, all your remaining bills and uh, may the odds forever be in your favor as you, as you go, on, go ahead to the, uh, the end of session. Well, I appreciate it. And again, thanks so much for the interview and great to be on Sacktown Talk. All right. Thanks, Nancy. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. Take care.